Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. Uh, I'm uh, Will Goodhand, the Juicy Evangelist uh, at uh, global market research company Brain Juicer, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure today to talk to you uh, about uh, how the wisdom of the crowd compares with monadic concept screening 9,000 concepts later. Uh, you may be uh, familiar with the notion of the wisdom of crowds. Uh, it was expressed in the uh, James Surowiecki book of 2004 of the same name. Uh, and he set out uh, a uh, pretty cast iron case that when a crowd is wise, uh, sorry, that a crowd is wise when it is diverse, independent, and faithfully aggregated. Uh, he told the story of the Victorian scientist Francis Galton. Uh, he was a self-professed elitist, so he wanted to show how stupid the crowd was uh, and how uh, democracy uh, was a really bad idea. Uh, so to do that, um, he, uh, he got people in a, a marketplace to guess the weight of an ox that had been slaughtered and dressed, uh, and uh, the aim being to show that when you average the crowd's guess, they were way off, whereas the experts in meat preparation uh, were able to guess the weight uh, of the ox precisely. Uh, unfortunately for Galton's theories, it turned out that the crowd's guess was essentially perfect, as you can see there, uh, and better than any individual within the crowd, uh, but better particularly than the livestock experts. And he repeated these uh, experiments a number of times, and he was good enough and professional enough uh, to uh, publish his findings and accept uh, that his hypothesis uh, that the crowd was stupid uh, was actually completely wrong, and the crowd was very wise. Uh, Surawiki talks about uh, the other great example, the Iowa electronic market, bringing us up to, uh, up to date now. Um, the Iowa electronic market uh, is a, uh, a group of people, uh, middle class, non-representative essentially, non-representative middle class, American males trading shares uh, on the outcome of uh, American presidential elections and other elections over the past 20 years. And um, it turns out uh, that the aggregated uh, prediction of that uh, electronic market um, has been more accurate than the most accurate of opinion polls 75% of the time over that 20 year period. Now isn't that incredible? You think about opinion polls, the gold standard uh, of market research, uh, asking individual people what they're going to do, making sure that you have an incredibly carefully uh, picked sample, but then also, of course, doing all the magnificent weighting afterwards to make sure that everything's matched and representative on uh, uh, class, um, age, gender, uh, location, you name it. Uh, and still, a bunch of people saying, oh, I think this guy's going to win, are actually more accurate three quarters of the time. So it just shows the uh, awesome potential power, then, um, of, uh, of the crowd. Uh, and then we look at uh, applying uh, that approach uh, to market research. Uh, Brain Juicer, um, uh, having studied the book, uh, we, uh, we thought, right, well, let's see if we can make this work. The crowd is so powerful and so accurate. Um, you know, can we extend that principle then to say, well, look, you know, perhaps the crowd can be uh, at least as wise uh, at less cost, or possibly wiser even than a targeted sample uh, assessing a potential new product. Um, obviously, uh, it was key then to uh, obey the uh, sort of principles set out by uh, Surawiki, uh, namely that it needs to be a, a really broad uh, crowd for the uh, for the crowd to uh, to actually function uh, in in the correct way. Um, that they are uh, not answering uh, out of personal preference, but instead uh, considering how the market will react to particular uh, ideas. Uh, and finally, um, well, obviously, as you probably imagine, uh, if you're having a crowd making all the decisions, then in fact you're looking at a, at a comparative methodology rather than a, a, a sort of absolute monadic. You know, each uh, each person sees only one concept. And well. Uh, uh, the remarkable thing is that uh, you know from applying 
uh, this technique to market research. I suppose there ought to be four points there about about it. The first one is it's worked, <laughs> um, and uh, and as I say, it kind of gone on and and, and screened nine thousand concepts in this way. Uh, but the benefits uh, of the approach, proven accuracy, which I'll share with you very briefly, uh, greater discrimination between the concepts being tested, and finally, very interesting one, uh, which I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, a little example, the ability to spot breakthrough ideas uh, as well. Um, so uh, very interesting stuff. So I'll just sort of take you through um, the uh, 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 very briefly just how it works. Uh, so you have your, your crowd there, and the key thing, of course, is to get them thinking uh, as a crowd. So they're, they're not answering for themselves, uh, because you know that would be very much the kind of me research, if you like, um, and, and almost getting into that sort of expert territory. We want, we want people to answer for, for how they think these ideas will do in the market. Um, and the way we do that is to say, um, Imagine your own shares in all these ideas. It's a really incredibly simple way of getting people into a kind of Dragon's Den style, if you have, if you have that TV show where you are, uh, but essentially getting people to kind of be a little bit dispassionate, if you like. So it's not about whether or not I would buy the cheddar cheese being tested. It's about whether I think, even if cheddar cheese brings me out in hives, the, the issue is, um, you know, do I think other people in the market would buy this? Once we do that, uh, we say, OK, uh, we do a little bit of a sifting exercise. So this is actually, uh, for the research aficionados, this is a little bit monadic. Well, it is monadic. It's hard to be a little bit monadic, isn't it? Um, we say, we show each idea and say, would you probably uh, buy shares in this? Or would you probably sell shares in it? So that way, we're just sort of sifting down the pot. So when we get people to make the final judgment and say, uh, which one would you uh, sell all your shares in because you think it's least likely to succeed in the market? Uh, you know they're choosing from a sort of smaller pot of, uh, of ones they've kind of pre-profiled as uh, as ones they're not particularly keen on, and we say which one would you double your shares in uh, as most likely to succeed uh, in the market? So really, kind of uh, getting it to uh, to pull pull the things apart. Uh, and here, this is quite a busy chart, but don't worry. It's incredibly intuitive. Look at the green bars across the top. Those are for each of the concepts tested. Then that is the percentage of people who were doubling their shares in that concept. So they were saying, yep, I think that, uh, that concept is going to be the most successful in the market. Then you have your uh, stalactites, if you like, in red there. Uh, that is the percentage of people who are selling their shares in that particular concept, saying, this, I actually believe this concept is going to be the least successful of all the concepts here in the market. So, of course, what you do by the, the magic of mathematics, if you take the red away from the green, you get the net preference. So that's the blue number on top of each of these bars. So that's the absolute score, if you like, uh, buyers minus sellers. Uh, and you get a very clear picture. These ones on the left, we've put the fast forward signs on. Uh, that's the sort of marketing uh, recommendation traffic light then. A little bit more sensitive than red, green, and yellow. Actually, they have these five uh, uh, buttons taken from a 1980s hi-fi somewhere. Um, so two fast forwards on the left there. One's clearly, you know, lots of doubling of shares. Obviously, a bit of a judgment call being made here between concept B and C uh, about uh, the, the concept C being a, a sort of a play rather than a real fast forward. So the diagnostics obviously pointing up, needing a bit of examination. And, and then you get across to concepts O, S, N, M, and W, uh, and you can see that they are eject concepts that are doing really badly, lots and lots of selling of shares and very limited enthusiasm in terms of buying uh, in the green. Uh, I'll uh, just draw your attention to the ones, the side of the yellow dotted line, the ones with pause buttons. Um, they are ones where we see a lot of trading uh, in both directions. So quite a lot of people doubling their shares, quite a lot of people selling their shares. And, and that's a very interesting characteristic of predictive market, where sometimes perhaps this would get buried in your kind of monadic purchase intention. Uh, but here, you know, you can really see what's going on, people buying and selling. And this tends to point to potential breakthrough concepts, concepts that are inadequately expressed at the moment, but there's clearly a germ of potential there, uh, or potential niche ideas. And so we really burrow into the diagnostics on those uh, and look at that and a bit more on that uh, in a moment. 
so just uh, very briefly to whip through then uh, what are those three strengths that I, I mentioned earlier about predictive markets. Well, the proven accuracy, I mean, very interesting, um, you know, just four sort of quick case studies shoehorned onto a slide. Um, you can see a predictive market, the, the top left one, first of all, for uh, Unilever's Lynx or Axe brand, depending where you are. Uh, and, uh, you know, a really, really clear result there. Uh, you can see the for concept A, which was a um, kind of a deodorant where you could uh, have a, uh, a flavor for the morning, a sort of fresh uh, get up and go type fragrance. Uh, and a kind of musky tobacco -y, I can't imagine it actually smelled of tobacco, but a, a musky scent for the evening, uh, and then a sort of button where you could combine the two and presumably get a wonderful scent from mid-afternoon nap. Um, but, you know, that sort of Lynx 3 product, which you, you may well have seen, uh, you know, a, a sort of real kind of, uh, a, a real success now in market, uh, and one which clearly here the predictive market was pulling out as head and shoulders um, above a range of other uh, sort of antiperspirant uh, ideas. Uh, if we look very briefly, uh, you can see there uh, Cadbury's Dairy Milk, um, uh, two different um, uh, concepts, but both with uh, um, biscuits, essentially with crunchy bar in the middle and then uh, honeycomb type filling. If you're not familiar with crunchy bar, it's very nice. Uh, do suggest you try it. Um, and uh, you know these these wonderful uh, biscuits in sort of full size and bite size, both really clear, uh, fast forward ahead uh, concepts. Uh, and then the uh, our client there, Steve Morris from Burton Foods, uh, saying that they literally now that they've been launched, they cannot be manufactured fast enough. So another example then of the crowd really pulling out. Yeah, and saying, yeah, these are the ones to go for. Um, five different Febreze uh, range extensions in the uh, the bottom left-hand corner there, uh, and a really big correlation between the really strong correlation uh, between the results from the predictive market and the sales. And finally, Marmite Squeezy. Love it or hate it. Um, uh, the crowd was nonetheless very clear that uh, dealing with that frustration uh, of getting this vegetable uh, extract spread out of a glass jar with a knife, a spoon, a spanner, whatever it is you need to get the last 10 milliliters out of one of these pots, that actually Marmite Squeezy was a fantastic uh, way of extending uh, the uh, extending the line, uh, and sure enough, uh, it's gone on to prove to be uh, very successful in the market. I mean, the interesting thing is, um, and uh, you might think it's uh, it's faintly paradoxical, but um, the uh, on average, uh, as you can see from these correlations here, um, the predictive market picks out the same winners as monadic testing. Uh, the difference is. Uh, and there is a bit of a difference, you can see, because the correlation is this is in back-to-back -back tests, obviously, where we've back-to-back -back the monadic against the um, uh, predictive market. Um, you know, correlation 0.91 for monadic testing, uh, and uh, a correlation of 0.81 for sequential monadic testing. So, you know, a good, I think, encouraging to see. You'd expect there to be a bit of a trade-off if you're going to test sequentially rather than uh, monadically. And... Um, uh, you know that little bit of difference um you know likely to be accounted for you know certainly the crowd is able to not just in the way that a consumer would answering for themselves say oh yes i'd buy that because you know they think they'd like to try that new drink even though of course they'll never buy it again in their lives uh, you know the crowd is able to sort of take that view in the round because they're assessing overall market potential and so you sort of um, I think that kind of uh, repeat uh, is in there as well as uh, as well as trial so uh one uh, one example here, and it's only based on one concept, but uh, as you're probably aware, it's highly unusual to test uh, the, exactly the same concept between screening and uh, kind of final concept testing. Uh, but here was one uh, that was, uh, and you can see that it actually fell into exactly the same percentile of the database, uh, give or take one point uh, uh, between the predictive market test and the, and the monadic concept test. So just an example of, uh, of how well uh, you know, those two things, uh, the two approaches can align. And a wonderful example here, and I'll let you pause for a, a sharp intake of breath. Uh, you know, a question we get asked a lot is, um, you know, all right then, 
I can understand the use for cheddar cheese, but come on, once you start getting into niche markets, specialist areas, how effective is uh, the predictive market approach really? Come on. Uh, well, I offer you this uh, case study. We presented it at FMRA, the uh, uh, Medical Pharmaceutical Conference 2009. Um, there were a few people who needed medical attention, I think, by the time we finished presenting. Uh, we used the predictive market of consumers to assess uh, the strength of different communications concepts to uh, communicate the benefits of a, rheum a rheumatology drug to rheumatologists. And we briefed the crowd that that's what we needed it to do. Uh, and the crowd picked out the same top three in the same order as the sample of rheumatologists who had cost 10 times uh, as much to research uh, as the uh, as the as the crowd so um, you know that's pretty remarkable so if you back it off a bit and say oh it's a bit of a niche market <laughs> uh, you know we, we've seen many examples where uh, uh, you know the crowd has been extremely effective um, very briefly um, the uh, uh, just to say uh, you know kind of point of reassurance really is you want to know of course um, you know if a concept does well and gets a fast forward uh, have I just tested it with a bunch of terrible concepts um, the reassuring thing the fact that we do ask people to sift at the start there between probably buy and probably sell is that actually we get a very stable number uh, which enables you to have a point of reference for uh, making sure that a concept's performance uh, is uh, is representative uh, in the particular test and not affected by the the crowd that it's uh, the company it's keeping um, very stable cross-country norms an answer to the challenge of course that uh, if you're testing in a, a wonderfully enthusiastic culture like Central and South America where of course it can be a nightmare to try and sift out from the 93% top two box purchase intention scores exactly which of the concepts you should proceed with uh, the, uh, the power of the, the predictive market simply by dint of getting people to do that exercise and it's not about what do you think are you enthusiastic about this new product I'm coming up with uh, instead to actually force people to say what would I double my shares in as a canny investor suddenly actually brings down uh, that overread uh, and gives you a much more stable basis for uh, making decisions uh, and uh, a very stable across uh, category um, uh, as well um, and, and kind of in keeping with that, and this really helps again in those enthusiastic markets, but helps even in, in uh, more sanguine, uh, cold, cold-blooded uh, uh, markets too, uh, is the ability that the predictive market has to distinguish between concepts. Because you're getting people to double their shares in the green there and sell their shares in the red, you inevitably get a pulling apart of the concepts, which is more reflective of how they would actually perform if they were launched in the market. You know, look at this for these equivalent concepts, another back-to-back -back study, look at that flatline monadic score there. Not a great deal of difference between the concepts in a monadic test because you're testing with a target sample, uh, they're all saying, well I do eat cheddar cheese and here's another cheddar cheese idea, yeah perhaps I would buy it, probably would. Um, you know, whereas actually if you ask people, come on, which one of these am I going to put hundreds of thousands of pounds, maybe millions behind as I push it through my innovation funnel? Which one should I bother spending the money on? Then you actually get consumers giving you a far clearer picture and you actually end up being able to make much better business decisions because you're sitting around in the boardroom saying, what should we do? What should we proceed with? And you won't have the person who's, say, who, who's been backing, say, Concept 4, which has done pretty well okay in the, mon in the monadic test, you can see from that gray line, uh, they're not going to have a look in, are they? Because you can see from the results of the market that it is deeply low energy. This concept will just sit on the shelf anonymously and will not sell. Uh, and the crowd is really giving you that picture. So we don't need to humor the person who's the advocate of that concept and keep putting money behind this. We can focus all our money behind concept one and possibly concept two, have a look at the diagnostics, uh, and push those uh, forward. Uh, and therefore gain competitive advantage and make lots of money. <laughs> uh, and there you can see that's the net preference plotted, so you can see the big difference between that uh, and those monadic scores. 
Uh, I won't dwell on this, but simply to say uh, the net preferences, obviously, you can see there a much bigger range between the wheat and the chaff, the strong uh, and the weak concepts across a number of different categories. Again, just to sort of uh, uh, reassure that across categories, you're getting that clear picture, that clear decision-making data. Uh, finally, uh, and I referred to this briefly earlier, um, the ability to pick out breakthrough ideas. And those are the ideas you can see an example there, uh, where you've got a lot of trading with people uh, doubling their shares and a lot of trading people selling their shares. So those are concepts where we say, well, look, there's obviously a lot of energy here. You know, some of it's negative energy, um, but this is an interesting one. You know, it's not like concept four we were looking at a minute ago, where it's deeply anonymous and, and deeply mediocre. Uh, this is one where, hmm, yeah, let's look at the diagnostics. If you tweak it, uh, if you get, have a slightly different target audience, this is one uh, where it could have a lot of potential. And so you're not actually, uh, you know, you're not actually um, losing uh, uh, in, in the kind of white noise of the flatline monadic test, you're actually seeing, no, no, buried in here uh, is a concept, you know, quite conceivably um, with a lot of potential. Uh, and, uh, and then to look at the diagnostics and see how that could be enhanced. And here, uh, you've probably read it as I've been, uh, as I've been talking, um, Alvin and the Chipmunks um, at movie here. And um, uh, one that, uh, uh, you know, with a bit of help, uh, what we felt was going to be a performer, and you can see from the, the final box office results, uh, oops, uh, forgive me, a little over overexcited, uh, uh, you can see from the final results then um, that, uh, you know, that actually was a performer with a little bit, uh, a little bit of fettling uh, to, uh, to how they were targeting it, and a really strong correlation uh, between the predictive market and the final performance of the films at the box office. So, uh, just to, to wrap up then, uh, there were some things even before we did our latest meta-analysis, there were some things from the first few thousand concepts we tested that we sort of knew, uh, but uh, you know, that the markets were accurate, we'd seen that already in back-to-back -back tests, that they were very discriminating, they produced stable norms, they could spot those breakthrough ideas when there's a lot of share trading, uh, they provided rich qualitative diagnostics, very cost-effective and, uh, and swift as well, because you get the crowd together and they all do it at the same time. Um, uh, but also some of the things that have really come out, you know, particularly in the recent uh, uh, analysis, uh, you know, this lack of variability between countries, making it much easier to sort of read across and make those decisions, uh, lack of variability between categories, um, uh, not a lot of subgroup variation, by the way, it's very stable in that respect too, uh, and particularly then that effectiveness in specialised categories and, uh, and application across um, a, a number of things, campaigns, um, I didn't really talk about this, but, uh, you know, campaigns, promotions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, just a little bit of a whistle-stop tour then uh, of how the, the wisdom of the crowds compares to uh, monadic concept testing. Um, but uh, I hope it was uh, uh, at least interesting, uh, if, not, uh, if not more. Uh, and uh, thanks very much uh, indeed for joining me. Cheers. Bye-bye.